Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free 14-day trial, go to squarespace.com slash forecast. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast, episode 71. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson. And this is the show where we get together with a couple of smart folks every week and talk about the future. Uh, Scott, are you excited? I am excited, Tom. It feels like yesterday that we just did a show, and I'm excited to do it again one day later. Uh, that's because that's you sleep true. from Tuesday yeah. through Sunday. <laughs> that's true, <laughs> but people um, don't realize we that. have some pretty cool guests today, uh, uh, interesting thinkers, so this would probably be uh, one of our better episodes. Joining us is Jonathan Keats, conceptual artist and experimental philosopher. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you. It's good to have you along. Also joining us, Brett Rounceville, creator of The Provider comic book and founder of Rounsa. Welcome, Brett. Hi, friends. Good to have you folks along. Uh, we'll start out with a prediction from the listener, something that was emailed into us by Sean, who says, I am Sean from Indiana. And while I was listening to forecasts the other day, I heard the prediction of people eventually moving underground. That idea has kept me thinking nonstop about the idea that if we are to leave the surface or expand beyond, where would we go? My prediction is instead of going underground, we move underwater. Once the whole pressure thing is taken care of, it wouldn't take too much effort to keep self-sustaining cities underwater. The cities could be powered by current or geothermal vents. Food could be gathered from fishing or gathering kelp. Water can be recycled or desalinated from the surrounding water. Air can be recycled or filtered. And more O2 can be brought in from electrolysis. This would also give us hydrogen supplies. Honestly, I can see this done in the next 20 years. Additional benefits of this are that if there are issues with our atmosphere or electromagnetic field, being underwater would be safer than being on the surface, and there is plenty of room for expansion, which would lead to exploration of our world's final frontier. We would just have to watch out for giant squids, mega sharks, crab people, and large golden spheres. <laughs> <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't considered the large golden spheres. The one problem, and he brought it up early in his email, and that's overcoming that quote-unquote pressure thing. <laughs> um, that's the hard part. If we can figure out a way to do that, then yes, I'm all for expanding into the sea. That seems like a lot of open space we can deal with. Uh, we can suspend a lot of what we do sort of in uh, the water so it's not trapped down and connected to tectonic plates and things so we can kind of avoid certain kinds of disasters. But that pressure thing, Tom, it's a doozy. It's a lot of pressure. But if we could overcome it, uh, Jonathan, would you would you risk the giant squids and mega sharks uh, to for humanity to move underwater? I think that it might be interesting to move underground underwater, and that way you might be able to protect yourself from the pressure and have the best of both worlds. So you is that, is that true? Would we not experience the pressure if we were under the ground, like in in sub oceanic caves? Well, it would depend on whether you were able to seal those caves off effectively. Oh, okay. and um, uh, basically counteract the pressure. I mean, essentially have a buried submarine underneath the ocean. Gotcha. So you, you'd be pumping in your own equalization, so to speak. So to speak, yes. Yeah. So so turn the Earth into one giant submarine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Brett, Sign me up. Brett, uh, would you paint the world yellow in that case? Would I, would I paint the entire underground submarine yellow? Well, <laughs> paint the earth yellow. The earth is now a submarine. Would I paint it yellow? Uh, no, no, that sounds like way too much work. I'm a big pragmatist. The less work, the better. Which is why uh, going underwater seems like an extra step, doesn't it? I mean, if you're already digging a big hole, uh, you don't have to build a bubble around it at that point, right? Yeah, yeah, but you've got nowhere else to go is the problem. So if we have completely depleted our resources up here and we can't figure out a way to poll uh, pollinate, <laughs> to uh, colonize other planets in an easy and efficient way, then we are kind of stuck. So our only way is to go down. Is it then too much work? No, no, no. That's why I'm saying. I think if you're going to go down anyway, then why not go down into the earth where uh, you're, the act of digging is creating your living space as opposed to having to solve that pressure problem 
with some massive structure that we don't even know how to build. Mm. Then there's the chud, though. It's a plumbing problem, though, so, and that's avoided if you're underwater. Mm. That's true. <laughs> that's true. But yeah, chud, well, right? Tom, or we could just the call up before. Clark, Chud's Clark. trouble. We could call out Harry Clark, plumber, if we did have any uh, plumbing problems. But that's a pre-show joke that no one who gets no. the podcast is going to understand. Exactly. Um, but what, what are you going to say about Chud, Scott? Uh, just that we have to always be careful of the Chud. Uh, we don't want to anger them. We don't want their king after us. Uh, beware of the Chud. That's all I'm saying. I'm yeah. not even saying they're real. You didn't hear it from me. We got to be careful if we're digging around down there. All right, folks, if you would like to have your predictions tortured and turned into something like this, send them along. Email forecastpodcast at gmail.com or post them up at the website forecastpodcast.com. Let's move into our short-term predictions, and we'll alternate between the guests, as we usually do. Uh, with short-term predictions, these are things, we, we just sort of loosely define it as things you'll think will happen sooner rather than later. Uh, and, Brett, we'll start with you. What is your short-term prediction for today? Yeah, I was actually just at the gas pump yesterday spending uh, $55 to fill up my very, very small car. And um, I was going through the process, which I do weekly, of trying to decide whether or not I'm going to turn my Datsun 280Z into an electric car. And uh, simultaneously, no less, booking a flight to Seattle, at which point I realized that the airlines are completely screwed. They have reached this point of inelasticity in their business model. Uh, they aren't turning into electric jets. They can't dump any of these people. So I'm pretty sure that the airlines very soon are going to become uh, some sort of luxury event. Like uh, they're going to price everyone that actually needs to travel out of the market. Just because of fuel costs more than anything, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, there's this thing. Airlines actually play kind of a stock market game with fuel as it is. So most of them buy their fuel months. And uh, I believe Southwest even buys it years in advance. So uh, it won't hit super soon. But eventually, they're going to hit these fuel prices that we're dealing with now. And there's no way that they can make money unless they start maybe enlarging the first class sections, charging higher prices. We're already seeing like all of these baggage costs and uh, now they're charging for food on the airlines and everything. And I think that's only going to get worse to the point that it's not useful for the average business traveler to actually fly anywhere. So what is, so that'll push us, because obviously people still need to travel. They still have to conduct a business right. and connect and so on. What, what does this push us toward? Alternative fuels? Does it push us toward alternative transportation models? high-speed rail, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think it will definitely, in, in the longer term, lead to alternative models and or alternative uh, transportation sources and or actual alternative airplane models. There, there, something is broken with the idea of jet fuel. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, without that fuel, there wouldn't be near the problems that I think we're going to head towards quickly. Does that John, make sense? Yeah, de definitely. Uh, Jonathan, uh, what what do you think? Are, are we gonna we're gonna lose the airlines? Or the, and if we did, what what would our transportation options look like? I think it's a plausible prediction. It actually makes me r recall the uh, strange way that my grandparents used to dress when they uh, got off the airplane. Well, they of course dressed that way when they were getting on the airplane too, and remained dressed that way. But what I mean is that they came from an era when there still was a little bit of the old luxury travel history to traveling by air. And so in a sense, it seems that we're kind of going to go full circle again to airlines being what they were during the Pan Am Clipper days. Um, and, you know, it might work. Um, it might work for the airlines, but of course it isn't going to work for most of us. And so it seems to me that perhaps this will help in some way, perhaps, to bring about other modes of transportation. And rail seems like probably the most practical of those. So, I don't know. No? I'm sorry? Did someone say no? I thought, no. I, I, thought I, heard, I heard someone say, just, just say flat out no to that. <laughs> like, well, no! <laughs> and I was shocked. Uh, but, but Brett Rounceville, a.k.a. Amtrekker, the uh, the the former hobo of the internet, uh, you have spent a lot of time on trains. Do you think that? Yeah. Do you think that the trains could rise to this this challenge? Uh, 
I think I think trains in another form are a viable option. I think right now they're every bit as overpriced as um, as airlines are, as far as just like genuine recreational travel goes. But what I did find super useful during my travels was the internet in its amazing ability to bring people together has solved a portion of this problem already just with Craigslist ride shares. And as cars are more easily adaptable to these alternative fuel sources, I think it's more likely that you'll just see uh, airlines and trains slowly pushing more and more people to gather together in their self-formed groups and travel, especially in the shorter distances. And as TSA security lines get longer and longer, yeah. it, it becomes just as, it takes just as long to drive somewhere as it does to fly. Because yeah, you, have, right. you, cause you, you, you take your time to get to the airport and then park the car and then get from where you parked the car to the airport and then get your boarding pass and then go through. The t I mean, it takes forever. It's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. You'll have to take a train just to get through the TSA security line. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. <clears throat> but it does, it does seem like the entire industry is, is due for an overhaul. And I don't know how you do that with an industry that depends on you know, every day, everything working, everything being on time, and when it's not having a system in place to sort of shuffle things around the way that they do, there's no time for them to, to stop and go, all right, we're taking a couple of months off, we're going to figure this thing out, we're going to have better fuel, we're going to build better planes, we're going to be more efficient about this or that. It seems like the kind of business that is sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't. The, the pricing is going to have to go up because fuel costs go up, and that's a real-time sort of fluid thing that's affecting their market and their business, and they can't do anything about it. So, you either, you either really do force a, a period of time where you actually, I don't know, trickle flights down to, to some of the, you know, the, the, the ones that have to happen every day or something, and you start figuring out ways to make your industry better, to move it into a new, uh, into a new era, something. I don't know what well, those answers happens. are, but it seems like we're poised for that. That could happen naturally. If it becomes enough of a luxury, then you're talking about so few people who will be taking the airplanes that it will trickle down to almost nothing. And then it will have to restructure. So it may correct itself in that respect. And then that's the, a really interesting point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, then things like the TSA delays move to where people are using it most. And you no longer have these this big security theater at the airport. You have it at the train station because that's where everybody is, is you know, going to be and that attracts the threat and then you have to have all the secure wouldn't it be better if security theater was actually more like real theater <laughs> <laughs> like yes. with an intermission yeah or with hot dogs <laughs> and snacks Where are you going? Yeah. I, I just, love that idea all right let's move on to you jonathan uh short-term prediction things you think that will happen uh, in the near term what do you have for us I'm going to make an audacious prediction, and what I think is a very frightening one, which is that in five years, we'll be essentially the same. I don't mean that um, our gadgets will be. They probably will have changed quite a lot, and by then, maybe I will even have my first cell phone or even a car. But what I mean is that we will remain the same as far as our our worldview and the world will have changed quite a lot. Uh, the world will have gone even farther in the direction uh, that global warming has taken us. And yet we will still be debating whether there is such a thing as global warming. We will still be at the stage before trying to make any sort of policy decisions that might, uh, might rectify matters. So I think that in the short term, things do not look particularly optimistic. I think Magnus Hewitt made a very similar prediction on last week's show. He's like, humans will carry on, that no matter what happens around us, the way things change around us, we just sort of stay the same. Uh, and 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 you're you're taking that a little another step further and saying, not only will think will we carry on, but we won't we won't adapt. We won't we won't change at all. Is that is that about right? Well, I think that in the next five years, the next ten years, I, I really am not seeing as time goes on, I'm not seeing any real change in the debate over the, the state of affairs in the world um, as pertains to the environment, let alone any real policy changes that might come out of that. So if we are still arguing over whether the, the science is real, and we've been debating this for the last five, 10, 
20 years. I mean, think back to how long ago it was that we were hearing about the hole in the uh, in the ozone layer. It's been a long time and we're still arguing over whether there is or there is not a problem. So I can't imagine given the slow pace of change, which doesn't even seem to be slow because it seems to be at a standstill. I, I can't imagine the next five or 10 years, we're really going to come to any sort of consensus that there is a problem, let alone toward any consensus as far as trying to come up with solutions such as a massive conversion to alternative energy sources and whatever else it might take. So at a, on a very fundamental level, this this is a very interesting topic to me because the the idea that you um, that, that we're not really changing as as a as a as human beings, we don't really change. We sort of recycle the same conflicts. We recycle the same. Uh, ideologies that that uh, you know one generation struggles with it sort of fades for a bit but then the next generation who didn't have a chance to fight with that are now fighting with it again as if it's their own new struggle and no one's ever had to deal with it before and it's kind of like this you know I see it in my own my own kids I have a 10 year old son who is struggling with a very specific part of school that I totally struggled with at his age and it doesn't matter how much I tell him that you know this is what you need to do. Learn from my experience. This is the history of what happened to me. So here's what you can do to avoid that history and make a better time of this. He doesn't. It's not even. It's not even clicking. It's just. Is you know, that him behind you? Him. What? Oh, is he? I don't know. <laughs> he might have been. Uh, but but you know what I'm saying. It's like you 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 try to you try to pass this stuff on. And the problem is, we as human beings, we find our independence. We want to think for ourselves. The old people didn't know any better than we do. We're young. We're you know, we've got our stuff going on and we're going to figure this stuff out on our own and, and we're going to solve the world's problems. And then that next generation does the same thing. And then they do the same thing. There's no way for us to, to truly give our history to a, an upcoming generation and say, all right, here are all the mistakes you don't want to make. They're still going to have wars. They're still going to fight about these issues. And they're going to still be talking about the ozone layer in another hundred years. Um, so I, I, I kind of agree with you. And I, it's unfortunate. It just feels like as fast as technology moves, It'd be nice if we could come up with a technology that would really put the lessons of our forefathers into the heads of, of current day people so that they could sort of avoid some of these pratfalls. But of course, we are very old technology ourselves. And to think about some sort of technology that can be uh, laid on top of, of us is about as practical as trying to take um, an IBM mainframe from the 1950s, less practical than trying to take an IBM mainframe from the 1950s and trying to make that work as a, I don't know, as a uh, cell phone or something of the sort. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we do we do make progress. We, we just sort of ratchet along, you know, and and I that was the one thing I was thinking when you were first stating this prediction, Jonathan, is that that's very likely that you'll write but then there's always that chance that we we make sudden progress when because a lot of times when we make progress we leap forward all at once and almost unexpectedly and i always think back to eastern europe when eastern when the berlin wall fell and the, the soviet union crumbled that's up until the point that that started to happen everyone said this will never happen it'll take forever we'll never unify germany and and in 5 years all of those things happened it was it was incredible and then things kind of stayed the same for for the 90s after that i think well, I that ratcheting analogy sorry go ahead I, I said i sincerely hope that i'm wrong by the way yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I would like nothing i would like nothing more than to be uh, shown to be a, an idiot as far as this is concerned but um but yes you are right there are sudden bouts of change but if you look at russia now and the way in which corruption works there, and you look at the Soviet Union, well, yes, the statues of Lenin and Stalin have come down, but there's more similarity than there is difference. Mm -hmm. Good point. Brett, what were you going to say? I think, the, uh, I think the ratcheting analogy... Oh, Brett, you like need to most... unplug and plug your, uh, your headset back in because you're doing the old uh, Plantronics driver dance. There we go. Try it again. <laughs> oh, now we can't hear you at all. Ah, uh, the Plantronics driver dance. <laughs> On the video version, uh, Scott's son just raced behind him. So, so he's Brett, trying. He's okay. trying not to interrupt me. Brett, go ahead and uh, give it a uh, shot. Again. Yes, yeah, the ratcheting go. analogy. Okay. I yes. love the ratcheting analogy because it seems especially apropos since 
uh, as you tighten that bolt and you make those ratchets, it gets more and more difficult to make those movements and to make those changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's absolutely what's happening and what uh, Jonathan was hitting upon is a large part of the reason why we're going to have a more and more difficult time of making those changes and admitting to global warming is the systems that we're building inside these systems. And we're just getting more and more bureaucratic about everything we do. So now we have to talk it to death before we can even decide whether or not it exists. And that's something that you wouldn't have had to deal with in like the industrial revolution when we made a huge leap forward. All right, let's move on to our long-term <laughs> predictions. Uh, these are, are a longer view, uh, more the in 100 years we'll all be in flying cars sorts of predictions. And uh, Jonathan, uh, we'll, we'll stick with you. What do you see in the farther future? I'm going to uh, keep on the theme of my five-year prediction and extend it out to 100 years. I believe that in 100 years, the, the vast majority of people will have lost their faith in science. I think this is true because the world will continue to destabilize, as has been the case already, again, on account of global warming. And that as the world destabilizes, the sorts of things that make one inclined toward a scientific worldview, that is to say predictability, that is to say um, a visible cause and effect structure in everyday life, will become less present in our lives. And as a result, we will not really have the, the, the everyday experience of what science is telling us. Moreover, the models that will be necessary to be able to explain everything that's happening around us um, in terms of the climate, for instance, will be so enormously complex that they will be intelligible only to a few scientists who will from the viewpoint of most people become as um, as obscure and as as mystical in a sense as, as priests. So in effect, science will become just another religion. And I don't think it will be a very successful one compared to the other religions on offer because Judaism or Christianity or Hinduism have much better narratives than would be a mathematical model. And also because the religions that probably will be most successful will be those that are the most escapist. That is to say, the new agey sorts of religions that will tell us that everything will be okay. And so science will become more and more of a marginal pursuit, a sort of a druidism for a few geeks who have gone on through the university system. Interesting. So, uh, <laughs> wow. If, if, we, if we get to the point where, I mean, sadly, I kind of agree with your, with your estimation. And you hear today in a lot of sort of talking head media, people who are reverting back to just, you know, they, they, they disguise it as good old fashioned American values. But what they're really saying is, I don't understand your science. Therefore, I'm going to back down and do the only thing I know how, which is to raise my cows and shoot at you when you come on my lawn sort of thing. And I, I don't mean to blanket statement, you know, an entire group of people, but yeah, he doesn't mean all dairy farmers are like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, what I'm getting, and they should be defending their cows. So I'm, I'm with them. But what I'm saying is it seems like there's already a tendency for this. We see things that are, that are getting more complicated, more convoluted, or at the very least the way they're being shown to us, explained to us and taught to us is so far beyond the common sensory that we've all been given that we start to get a little freaked out by it, back off from it, and then go to the comforts of life that, you know, that we know we can rely on. Well, if I, if I get my hot tub, I'm going to have a good time in there. If I'm, you know, going to eat a hamburger, it's going to feel good or whatever. You can kind of go back into your creature comforts and forget about advanced sort of crazy thinking that, you know, seems to be taking over the world. I could totally see this happening. I don't think you're that far off. I, I, I think you're, pro you're probably right. You have a very good chance of being right because of the direction we've taken in emphasizing true education uh, and not just the, the manufacturing version of education that we have now where we say, well, you, you need to be plugged through the university uh, so that you can get your MBA and go into business or, you know, be, become an engineer and work a, at, at the uh, software plant. Or, you know, it's, it's very vocational, our approach to education. And we had a wave for a while where we thought that education was good because it actually taught people how to think. 
And if you teach people how to think and you teach them to have critical reasoning and you, and, and you give them a wide background of things, they have better tools with which to interpret what science is telling them in all its various flavors. And you have less of a chance of it turning into a religion. But that's not the direction we've been going. We've been narrowing education and saying, well, what's the practicality in having people take all these various classes when they just need to get a job? Let's have them only take the classes that are really important to give them a job. And we keep narrowing the budgets and and becoming more efficient and applying the, the principles of manufacturing to education, which then turns out people who are limited in how they can critically think and how they can deal with things, in which case I think if that's that trend continues, it leads exactly to the door of what you're talking about, where science becomes nothing more than another thing you have to take on faith, if, if I'm interpreting you correctly. Well, I think that's part of it. And, and certainly part of the problem comes out of science not because of the state of the, of the world, because of the environment, but because of the very way in which science accumulates knowledge and theory is based on experimentation or observation. And this sort of bootstraps to a higher and higher level of the amount of knowledge that is necessary to be able to really make sense of anything. I and mean, quantum mechanics is quite a bit more difficult, or general relativity is quite a bit more difficult to grapple with than Newtonian mechanics. And that this is continuing to become more and more, um, more and more the case, that, that string theory is even more obscure. This is simply as a result of science doing what science is made to do. And that science as a result kind of loses a lot of people unless scientists are very, very good at communicating. And even then, it still is a greater disconnect. I think that that, that is happening and perhaps is um, inevitable in some way. But the, it's the confluence of that and the destabilization of the environment that makes it so that even the very basic sort of Newtonian worldview no longer makes much sense as far as what people are encountering when the weather is utterly completely beyond any sort of uh, prediction, any sort of prediction that a farmer could have made a couple thousand years ago, that no farmer could possibly make the prediction anymore because it's just the weather has gone too wild. The combination of these two factors, I think, puts it over the edge, puts it into a whole new category from the category we, we have right now, which is a university system that tends to value vocational uh, education together with the fact that science requires a level of mathematical aptitude that is simply beyond the interest level, if not the reach of most people. Brett, what do you think? I mean, you're, if you, you're coming at this from a, from a different angle, uh, where you you're you've just you know finished a couple of years ago riding around the country uh, with nothing but the clothes on your back uh, and now you're trying to get a job do do you see science differently after being out and experience things no i don't I don't think I do and i'm I'm all on board the destabilization train and my prediction <laughs> plays in that a little bit too i I totally see that side of things coming to fruition but i i I have a hard time agreeing with the idea that science will turn into a religion unless what you mean by religion is small and weak. But I, and not that religion is small and weak, just that it seems difficult to believe that, uh, that the people who are thinkers in our society, and there are any number of them, I'm not saying like the people that are taught to think, I'm just saying the people that put effort into thought in life, it, it's difficult to believe that those people will stop thinking about what leads to science and using the scientific method and start taking it as an actual article of faith, which is how I would interpret the word religion. Interesting. Well, I, I had a, per when, when Tom and I were interviewed by our wives for the show, one yeah. of my predictions was that there would one day be a great science versus religion war. Does this play into anybody's theories? Like, can I be validated here a little bit that we're going to have a fight <laughs> before this is all over? No. <laughs> I guess that I, I'm, I'm sort of seeing it as from from the point of view of those who are engaged in science, 100 years from now, these people will still be engaged in science and the science will be probably more interesting than it is now for the sheer 
complexity of it for the uh, sheer amount of material that scientists will have to work with, but that those who are scientists and those who are not, that that gap will grow and will perhaps become so unbridgeable that those who are not scientists will look upon scientists as a sort of priestly class and on will look upon science as just another one of many religions and not the most desirable one. And that that will be the case, first of all, because in order to be able to do science at all will require so much work that most people will not even be able to get started. And secondly, that their everyday experience in life because of the destabilized environment will not be one that seems at all rational, that would only seem rational if you were to have extremely sophisticated models you were working from. And so as a result, what happens from day to day in terms of the weather will have the quality of a miracle. And so any religion will be as good as any other, except that those religions that make for a simpler way of looking at the universe, and for perhaps a more comforting way of looking at the universe will be those that will simply have the best marketing, that will have the uh, the best ability to capture the imagination of the most people. We, we, we shouldn't forget here that uh, science is, is actually not a monolith. It, you know, there are various kinds of science uh, and various kinds of scientists uh, and and getting them to agree across disciplines with each other is, is probably a barrier to science as a whole becoming this, but I could easily see certain individuals in certain positions of responsibility deciding to take advantage uh, of what Jonathan's talking about. It's an interesting thought. Brett, let's move over to your uh, long-term prediction because uh, you said it, it sort of relates to this, uh, at least in the destabilization sense. What do you got for us? Right. I, I definitely don't have a whole lot of faith in uh, in the world floating along free and clear. I, I think Americans in general and maybe even our state governments and our federal governments in particular have already proven that the American people as a whole should not be allowed to touch money. Uh, we have no fiscal control over what we're dealt or what we spend our monies on as it is. And um, sooner or later, everyone is just going to start going bankrupt. And I don't mean everyone is in people. I mean, like whole countries are going to go bankrupt. And if you draw parallels to companies that go bankrupt, it's really easy for um, a company that maybe has something cool to offer to get bought up. But there's just as many of those companies that uh, just disappear forever, never see or hear from them again. But that can't happen with a government because there's still people there. There's still resources, even if, those only, even if the only resources available are those people. So someone's always going to pick up the pieces. Bottom line, I see us being much closer to a global economy and a global dollar in 100 years than now. That's a really uh, bold but not uncommon prediction. Uh, the, usually the objection to it is, is getting everyone to agree on a common currency would be unthinkable. But then that was unthinkable in Europe uh, you know, probably in the in the late 1800s, I'm guessing, you know, the idea that Germany and France could agree to use the same currency, it will never happen. And of course, it mm. has. So uh, it's 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 hard to conceive of the United States giving up the dollar. Uh, but it's not hard to conceive of the United States going into bankruptcy, especially right now when we're, you know, a couple weeks away from the government shutting down. And I, I think you kind of painted a rough picture of how that if everybody goes bankrupt, then you, you almost have to go to some sort of common way of of accounting. At least it's, right. it's possible. I yeah, I don't think it's going to be an issue of talking people into using the same dollar. I think it's going to be more an issue of China saying, all right, well, I guess you're ours now. So here, use a yen. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's just a, a note of local interest. Um, our local legislature, our state legislature here in Utah has decided in their infinite wisdom to push a bill or try to push a bill through that would put us back uh, to the gold standard here in this state. So I could buy, trade, and sell goods using gold. Um, Presumably from the, the tooth, I have some gold in because that's really the only gold Wait, I have. But the, the state of Utah doesn't issue currency, does it? How can they? No, have, what, it what would course. the gold standard be on? 
Uh, it would be they they the way they've been, and this is why everyone thinks it's a little crazy. The way they've been talking <laughs> about it is you would literally be using gold, whether you melted it down from something or you had bullion in some other form or you got it issued to you via the state in this, in some sort of emergency or whatever. That that's how you would get the gold. <laughs> and it's and it's as it's it sounds. But I weird. could do that. It, I could do that right now. I, I don't know. So is Utah not going to honor the the federal dollar anymore? I'm well, sorry. It's just weird. Well, that's some of the talk. But here's the, here's the thing. And they are weird. They're, they just we just have we now have a state gun. So they're weird. But <laughs> here's what I that. here's what I want to say about this whole gold thing. If if you their idea is this that you could go to McDonald's and buy your Happy Meal, Tom, which I know you love the Happy Meal. That you could go there the and get nuggets. a happy meal <laughs> with a gold coin that you melted down from like jewelry or whatever. That that should be a ma statewide mandated acceptable oh, okay. form. Of I payment. see. They they would they would force businesses to accept it as currency. Right. And the point, and the reason I'm bringing this up at all, because it's a little bit unrelated on on the whole. But the reason I brought it up is I heard somebody quoted on on the on Capitol Hill saying that they they felt like this was the way of unifying currency across the nation at some point. Though at some point we would all agree that, oh yes, we're back to gold. Gold is the way to do it. It's the only thing with any real value in this world. And this is what we should use. And everyone's writing them off as crazy. But, you know, it's that kind of thing, right? It's, it's, it, would, it would take a nation like ours to go, well, the dollar's not worth anything. And we're really ticked at China for basically owning us. So what are we gonna do? And crazy stuff happens when that happens. I mean, the euro is, a, is like you said, it's a great example. No one ever would have thought that France and Germany would be using the same currency at any point. And they're they're sharing money. I mean, it's it sounds crazy, and it's that when we're just fifty years from when that would have been crazy. So I, I'm, I yeah, I think his prediction is probably right. We're we are headed there one way or the other. The question is how soon. Jonathan, are are you going to uh, go on the gold standard? I think this is all very interesting. Um, the gold standard is tempting, though I think I would probably put my money in meteorites first. Um, I think the idea of this sort of bankruptcy is completely plausible, but I wonder whether there might be another eventuality which could potentially be a sort of a new colonialism in the form of uh, leveraged buyouts of countries by other countries, mm -hmm. taking, taking this uh, idea of bankruptcy, of countries going bankrupt, and looking at how companies going bankrupt tend to get bought up, stripped, and tend to get uh, repurposed. Well, that sounds a lot like colonialism in a way. And this could happen in a sort of for lack of a better term, a sort of postmodern economic way in the future were bankrupt countries somehow to be on a, some sort of a trading system that they could be bought up, broken up, repurposed. This is horrific, but I don't know that it's so implausible. What would layoffs look like? Because usually <laughs> that's part of it, but when you buy out a bankrupt company, that you then go in and fire a bunch of people. Just well, I, th I think that we're back to the whole uh, living underwater idea that we started with. <laughs> well, that would or, be our new. That would more like. Go ahead, Brett. All right. So basically, someone would buy California and say, "We don't need anything north of San Francisco, right?" <laughs> just you guys. You guys can just. Why don't you go hang out with Nevada? We're going to spin that off and send. Uh, you know, we really got to let twenty percent of you go, so we're sending you to the caves. It's the right. new Australia. <laughs> All right, let's take a, a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace, without which we wouldn't be able to do this show. This episode, of course, brought to you by Squarespace, the fast and easy way to start a high-quality website or blog. You want to start, you know, I'm for the gold standard in utah.squarespace.com. You can do it right now with a 14-day free trial. Go to squarespace.com slash forecast, F-O-U-R-C-A-S-T. You can start any website you want. And the key is not only will it be beautiful because you can just pick from one of their templates, but you can get in and customize it and make the entire thing look gold. Or if you're advocating moving underwater into caves, you could make it look like an underwater cave. You just tweak the color templates. You put in some pictures. You, you can even get in there and customize the CSS if you want, but it's easy enough that you don't necessarily have to. You can still make it look really good. Uh, you can take your old blog, if you've already got one, and import a type pad or WordPress blog or movable type. Why not try it out? 
today. Squarespace.com slash forecast. You don't need a credit card. You just need an idea. That's the harder part. But it's nice to know that you don't have to type in that credit card number. Squarespace.com. We thank them for their support of forecast. Try it out now. Free. 14 days. You've, you've got to have an idea by this point in the show of something you would like to do a website around. Squarespace.com slash forecast is the place to try it out. Give it a shot. 14-day free trial. What's to lose? All right, Brett, let's uh, stick with you as we move into the crazy-ass predictions. Uh, this is just, you know, time frame doesn't matter. Topic doesn't matter. It's just the one that you think is the, the farthest out there. What do you got? I'm really excited about this one, and I wish I would be alive to see it. Uh, but somehow I doubt that I will see the reverse Logan's run of the year 43-43, when by age 30, every human is more mechanical than biological. Whoa. So when you say reverse Logan's run, or do they... So everyone is born naturally. Yeah. It happens. And if you uh, don't a mommy, get... A mommy likes a daddy, uh -huh. and then they make a baby, and nine months later, you pop out a beautiful biological baby boy. But by the time they reach age 30, they're going to be more machine than man. <laughs> <laughs> or they're a runner. They're trying to preserve their right. biology. It, Is that Right. It's, yes. It's what, good to a run, bio. Tom. They call it's them a bio, run. and they have to live out in the forest. Yeah. And they're hunting. Wow. It's a sport. I love it. Oh, there's hunted. Okay. <laughs> now this is getting interesting. Um, yeah, I love Logan Drun Run. I've learned from that movie uh, more times than I can count. It is good to run. Um, I would ask you this. So what then would, why, so you say the mommy and daddy, how old are they? How old are mom and dad? <laughs> uh, well, they would have to have the right biological components left over. So they're probably still <laughs> in their 20s. Uh, no, actually, what I'm, what I'm really trying to say is, is I honestly believe that there will be enough room for improvements, mechanical improvements to human beings in the, in the far future that it would be silly not to opt into them. Although I still believe that they will be born without them. So, for example, I am one of those fascinating people with glaucoma and would love new eyeballs that, uh, that can see farther, see clearer, see better. There's no reason why if someone came to me tomorrow, I would not say, sign me up. And uh, I think it'll just be a, um, a product of having that access to those things that by age 30, you will be more machine than biological. It's not so much a state mandated carousel. <laughs> Yeah, but would you, but so tell me about the hunting part. So when you're 30 and you're more machine than man, what makes you so huntable? Like why and now are you, ooh, he's a perfect, he's the perfect guy to chase and kill. That might've been the part where I got carried away with myself and just started <laughs> shouting nonsense, uh, which happens, granted. But I would assume Ugh. that there are going to be those crazy holdouts that just want to be uh, biological and, uh, and they probably will be seen as a lesser class of human. Wow. Love it. Jonathan, uh, we get this prediction a lot. Uh, not, not this particular prediction, but we, we, we get a prediction quite often about man, machine, hybrid, how it will play out. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've probably thought about this before. What do you think of Brett's vision of how that would work? I think that the technology probably will be there. I think that the division between people will be probably more even than he is predicting. That is to say, I think that perhaps as many as half of the people will opt out and that you will have two increasingly distinct societies that will interact with each other less and less simply because they will have less and less uh, in common with each other. And so perhaps over time, you'll have some sort of evolutionary differences as well. That's a that's a very interesting thought that, you know, the differentiation that takes place as your body adapts to being able to have mechanical appendages, mechanical organs uh, that the, the bios don't have. They, and they, they just head off in a different direction because the selection pressures are, are different entirely. Brett, what does that leave us with? Um, that leaves us with, actually, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that in this imaginary future of ours, I don't, I don't think that there would be a 50, 50 split. I think it would be, um, some crazy holdouts that would do that. And I say that only because I, it would be a lot like adopting cell phones in my mind. Yes. There's still some people, apparently Jonathan doesn't own a cell phone yet, but there are still people that don't own cell phones, but for the most part, there's no reason not to. 
And um, as, as that becomes more and more clear, as these processes become more and more acceptable, more and more uh, easy to do, cheaper, everything else, if there's no reason not to do it, then it's only going to be crazy people that choose irrationally not to do it. You'd have to be crazy not to become a mech? All I'm saying is, <laughs> is, is when I say irrational, maybe I don't necessarily mean crazy, but it is, it is not the rational choice to not, make your, to not improve yourself. Right? But right. So if, so, if you, so if you... Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that I, I, I don't know that the uh, vast majority of the population is rational in that mm, sort touche. of way that uh, the vast majority of the world really is looking to um, um, optimizing in the way that a uh, corporate CFO is doing. Mm -hmm. No, that's a fair point. Well, also, I, uh, I, 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 the idea that I would have to opt into something like this, I mean, when does it end though? Okay, so let's say you've got bad eyes. So do I, by the way. Let's, let's make a club because I freaking hate it. Um, <laughs> I don't have glaucoma, but I've got, it's just issues. I hate my eyes. So you and I were dealt this bad hand of eyes. And let's say we live in a future when that's a common thing. And then, and the common thing to do is you go in and you stand in line for half an hour and they say, yep, you qualify, come on in, boop, new eyes. They're mechanical, right. they're machines. We now have a HUD, some sort of HUD heads up display inside our head, whatever. Uh, that's all great and, and fine and everything. At what point does that become does vanity start coming into it and leaking into it? So do we, we go from, well, I need these because I can't see very well to I need these because now I can see, you know, 60 yards further than the common person. And like plastic surgery, I now have an advantage uh, either cosmetically or practically. Like, do you see any trappings or trouble with that uh, politically, you know, maybe politically or socially in the future? Well, uh, first of all, I think vanity is always the first th thing to creep in in any social change. Um, if you look back before clothing, there were tattoos, and there's no reason for tattoos beyond personal vanity or, or of some sort, whether it's social class or whatever. And the same thing holds true with now. The, the closest uh, analog to replacing your eyes is plastic surgery, breast enlargement, and that's all vanity right now. So I think vanity will be there way before any usefulness will be there. Um, but I don't think that that will have any large social or political ramifications. I think that that's just the fact of human nature. All right, let's move over to you, Jonathan, for your uh, crazy prediction. Uh, the, the craziest thing you've got in, in your prediction suitcase, if I can uh, coin I was, a poor just, metaphor. <laughs> Very briefly, I was just going to say that I, I think that... Also, maybe it would not be irrational for someone to opt out in that we don't really know the future, in spite of the fact that we are predicting it here. And <laughs> there would be, at points in the future, a greater advantage to uh, being purely biological. If, if indeed there is a divide that takes place in terms of two different societies, as infrastructure falls away, as it could well do in the future, those who are not dependent on all of these enhancements might be at an, an, at an advantage. So I don't know that it's such a clear cut uh, decision as we made it out to be. Mm. Yeah. That, that said, and keeping on the theme of evolution, I'd like to give my, uh, I guess my most confident and my most optimistic prediction, which is somewhere in the 100,000 to million year range, which is that we will be extinct and bacteria will be predominant. And I think this is a good thing. Well, certainly not a bad one. I, I think that the idea that we're somehow special and should uh, somehow be the ones in charge, I, I don't I don't think that really there's any uh, right or wrong to it. And I suspect that bacteria will end up doing a lot of the things that we do in terms that are superior to the way in which we do them according to our own metrics. If you look at single cell organisms, you look at slime molds, which are not bacteria, of course, but if you look at, at slime molds in terms of their ability to use quorum sensing, which bacteria also have, and you look at the fact that 
that, that slime molds are able to model, for example, the highway system in England as efficiently as humans can using good computers, you recognize just how incredibly intelligent bacteria can be and how intelligent potentially they could be as that network expands. In other words, it seems to me plausible that bacteria will not have an internet, that they will in fact be the internet, that they will not have Facebook, that they will in fact be Facebook, and that this will afford them enormous advantages in terms of understanding the world in which they live, the world after us. And not only that, but also you think about things such as uh, data transfer. Well, they have gene transfer and they have none of the IP problems that we do. So you think about all the things that seem to give us our our knowledge, that seem to, to give us everything that we think of as being uniquely and specifically human. And it seems to me that bacteria are actually going to do a lot better job of it and just give them those hundreds of thousands or millions of years and the world will be a very interesting place for it. So how about this idea? How about... I love this kind of stuff because this is what this is what this prediction's about. It's about, you know, thinking way out, way, way outside the box. What if we could figure out now a way to harness the power of bacteria, the stuff in the water, the stuff in the air, the stuff that's clinging to everything, the stuff in our colon, I don't care where we get it. And we figure out a way to run the next generation like information network on that. And and, and I I sound like I'm being goofy, but I'm not. The idea of harnessing this interconnected uh, web of biological goo that's everywhere that we don't see it all the time, but it's everywhere. Why couldn't we harness that and turn that into, you know, Internet 3.0 and, and literally have it be a way of moving information around? Is that even, I mean, am I even talking in the same realm of, of like, even is there any possible way that could ever happen in anyone's mind? <laughs> am I crazy? <laughs> I think it's very interesting. It, it may be an intermediary stage uh, to what I am predicting. If you think about it, we are our microbiome more than we are human. If you, if you just take the cell count, um, the uh, microbial population within us is greater by a factor of a uh, hundred or something of the sort to um, to that of human cells. So our identity is already uh, predominantly by sheer uh, democratic terms is predominantly microbial. So potentially if we simply forego the, uh, the animal cells and we allow the microbial side to become ourselves in the future and we allow for all the quorum sensing and other networking possibilities of bacteria, it doesn't seem that while we will go extinct, in the animal sense, it doesn't seem that we necessarily need to go extinct in the sense of our microbiomes going. And as a result, we could as we, we could continue to persist within this system, interacting with each other in some sort of way of quorums within quorums. Um, and this could be a, a much more interesting future than anything that Facebook has to offer. <laughs> Which is why I'm investing in microbe space. <laughs> okay, now I'm being uh, goofy. But no, that, that is, a, that, that is a, uh, an interesting and, and elegant transformation where we, as information, just pass on into the network that you're talking about, whereas our, our support structure might become extinct. Uh, but, but somehow our, our, our informational culture is, is ported, so to speak. That, that's fascinating. All right, shall we uh, move on to the four questions then, Scott? I think we should. Four questions is where we ask you, our guests, four questions, rapid fire style. You are not allowed to think too hard about these things. Just kind of say what's in your gut, and we'll take it from there. I'm going to ask questions of Jonathan. John no, I, yeah, I am, aren't I? Yes, Jonathan, sir. are you sitting comfortably, we like to ask our guests. Yes. All right, here goes. First question. When we take our first elevator to space... Will we still have buttons to tell us where we want to get off? We will not have buttons to tell us where we get off because there will probably be an escalator to space before there will be an elevator. Nice. I'm all for this. Uh, let's see. Just watch your feet. When the, <laughs> right. When the technology becomes available, would you prefer to know or not to know what disease will eventually take you? 
I would prefer when the technology com becomes available to know all the diseases that will not take me so that in fact I live a very happy life. Ah, so you want to know which ones won't instead of the one that will? As many as possible, yes. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great way to flip that around. Uh, number three, what Star Trek based technology would you still like to see come true? I hate to admit it, but in addition to not having a cell phone, I have actually never seen an episode of Star Trek. Whoa. Then I'm going to tell you the technology that you want. It's called a Blu-ray player, and you need to... I'm just kidding. <laughs> you don't have to watch it. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Last question. Will the day come where our plants, in order to survive, survive, will graduate from the need for humans to talk to them to us as humans providing hardcore plant pornography for them to view? Well, since that day has already come, uh, courtesy of the plant pornography that I've been making for the last few years, pollen, uh, filming bees pollinating flowers, I think that probably um, the future will have many other interesting opportunities for plants as well, such as the uh, photosynthetic restaurant that I am about to open that will serve gourmet sunlight to plants. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but but uh, will that take? I, I like Scott's question here, which is, will it will it take away the need for us to talk to them if they have these other entertainment options? Well, aren't those ways of talking to them as well? <laughs> fairly put. That's fairly true. put. Okay. Yeah, I got to give Tom credit for inspiring the question. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> All right, let's move on to you, Brett Rounceville. Are you sitting comfortably? Not really. Not so much. Ah, we're getting uh, we're getting the the siloning again from your headphones. <laughs> That's just wrong. That's not supposed to happen more than once every hour. Yeah. Isn't that the rule? Actually, it's not supposed to happen at all. But even the bug <laughs> isn't supposed to happen more than once every hour. All right, Joey, so what do you what do you get? Talk to me. Talk to me, Brett. Not yet. <laughs> there it is. There we go. Um, all right. Uh, Brett Roundsville, are you sitting comfortably? Uh, really awkwardly height armed. No. Wow. Good. Then we'll begin. Question number one. In the future, will people travel between the stars by train? Oh, I hope so. Yes. Let's say yes. <laughs> and will you hitch rides on those trains? <laughs> uh, question number two. When the extraterrestrials arrive to finally claim their right as our overlords and visit you to demand your two required words of response, what will you say? I'm hungry. <laughs> I don't know if that will convince them to leave us alone, but at least it's honest. Yeah. Question number three, will we ever abandon Earth and why? Uh, I think that we will either abandon Earth or uh, die thanks to the things we've done to it. And we won't paint it yellow. We've learned that nope. much. Final question, what previously unimagined form of travel will one day become incredibly popular? Previously unimagined. Um, it's going to probably be the space shoe. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure space shoes are going to be huge just real soon now. You taking the space shoe out to Mercury this weekend? Yeah. yeah. Space shoe. Uh, tickets of the space shoe have been crazy with the fuel crisis. Buy so wait, is the now. shoe... I think space shoe... shoes are just luxury travel now. Is it a thing yeah. you wear or is it a thing we can all ride in? I'm picturing a giant shoe full of people. Scott, I can't believe you're asking me this question. This is just, I'm really embarrassed for you right now. I can't believe that I have to Help explain Help me. I'm losing geek you. cred. Clearly, clearly the space shoe is only a state of mind. Oh, duh. You buy a ticket, you buy a ticket to get into the space shoe's headspace, and then, uh, boom, Mercury. Wow. I just, All you right. know, I find it funny that my parents and grandparents used to dress up to, for their space shoes, and now people <laughs> yeah. just wear whatever. <laughs> Yeah. It was a more elegant time back then. Remember when you used to get to smoke in the space shoe? Ah, yeah. Ashtrays. They still the have arm. the do not smoke lights on the space shoe. I don't even know why those are there. Isn't that weird? Yeah. All, All right. See. That is it for this edition of Forecast. Thank you so much uh, for riding along with us. Jonathan Keats, a pleasure to have you on. Great to, great to hear your thoughts and talk to you. Tell folks a little bit about what you do beyond just the uh, the plant cafeteria and where they can find your work. 
Well, I'm not entirely sure what it is that I do. I, I call myself an experimental philosopher because I'm not yet sure what that means. I have a, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, a photosynthetic restaurant opening at the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, California next month. That will be my next um, undertaking under the rubric of art. And many other things along those lines coming up in the future at Modernism Gallery in San Francisco and several venues, including the AC Institute in New York City. Can people's plants attend the restaurant? Absolutely. The restaurant is being set up for the hundred-year-old rose bushes that are already living at the Crocker Art Museum, but I think that guests can be accommodated as well. Excellent. All right, good to know. And uh, Brett Rounceville, a.k.a. Amtrucker, uh, creator of the Provider comic book, the founder of Rounsa. Thanks so much for being on the show, man. It's, it's great to have you along as well and, and share your views of the future. Let folks know more about what you're up to. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Um, the provider will be coming out in a couple of months. There's a Kickstarter page that you can search for to get some more information there. And uh, I'm a productive member of society for the first time in half a decade. And I'm so check sorry it out. to hear that. Our, uh, our condolences. Yeah, it's, it's here. Uh, Thegogame.com. Thegogame.com. All right. Great. Thanks, uh, Scott Johnson, as always. No. No, no. Thank you, Tom Merritt, uh, as always. I love being on the show. Interesting stuff today. I can't wait to do it again. And uh, any any other uh, stuff you want to let no, people know about Nerdtacular or anything like that? Oh, sure. Let's tell people about Nerdtacular. Nerdtacular.com. They can get their tickets now. Tom's going to be there. Veronica's going to be there. Eileen Rivera's going to be there. A whole bunch of Frog Panther people are going to be there. I'll be there, of course. Uh, it's here in Salt Lake City, June 17th, 2011. A full day of uh, sort of community-driven hanging out and panels. And we got people from EA and Disney Interactive and all kinds of stuff happening. Uh, they can learn more at nerdtacular.com. And if they really want to find out what's happening minute to minute, they can follow me on Twitter, twitter.com slash extra life. And with that, uh, we wish you adieu. Don't forget that you can email us, forecastpodcast at gmail.com. Find our blog, forecastpodcast.com. We'll see you next time. Bye. Wait.